everybody, this is Magnum Pi of Initiative Zero, and I thought it was time that we do another Magnum's Musings. This time I'm going to be musing about character creation, and uh, yeah, particularly character creation in Rifts. Um, we've had people on our Discord and on our channel talk about character creation, and I thought it would be good to show people. We've had a lot of people that are just starting to play Rifts who have been talking with us. They've picked it up after a little while or after a long while or they're brand new to it. This is the first time they've played something other than D&D. &D. They wanted to go old school and, well, Rifts is old school. It's been continuously published since 1990 and it's still got new material coming out for it. So it's really kind of cool that way. So what I want to do is I want to make a character with you in Rifts using the rules that we've used to make our characters in our actual play A Face of Evil. Ever since getting back into Rifts, I, uh, I have a newfound appreciation for the random rolled character. I like the idea that a randomly rolled character is not my ego. I like the fact that it's somebody else that I have to bring to life. They're born from the randomness of the universe. They're not born from my desire to live out a better life or a different life or just even try something weird. It's just what I've been handed by the universe and it's my job as a player to breathe life into them and give them something more than just randomness could give them. So what I did was I went through Riff's Ultimate Edition, and a supplement or two other than that. And I said, well, how can I make this an entirely random generated character creation? Well, I guess not entirely. So what I did was, I said, well, we have all of these optional tables um, after, kind of at the end of character creation. They kind of start on page 296. That's called rounding out the character at step eight. And... Yeah, I said, well, a lot of those have to do with kind of the, the foundational or background component, and they're all random tables. So I said, all right, what if even your race or your species is determined randomly? How would I do that? Well, they have a table called family origin, and in there, there's enough wiggle room that you can determine whether your character is just a regular old human or whether they are some sort of DB or mutant animal or psychic or whatever. So that kind of gave us enough randomness. And you'll see on the screen there, my character creation rules are summarized there. Um, I'll put a link in this video as well so that you can have a copy of those character creation rules. But essentially it makes everything random. So I guess the best thing to do is start. We'll just start making a character together and I'll show you what we do. The first step on this list is to roll on the family origin table. The family origin table is found on page 297 in Riff's Ultimate Edition, and it's just a percentile roll. So I'll do that here in roll 20. Give a nice percentile roll. Here, let me get rid of the character sheet so we can see the dice. And a six. That means I'm a human. All right. So that's my RCC, my racial character class, is just a human Earth native means I'm from Rift's Earth. I'm not a DB human. I'm not from some alternate reality like Heroes Unlimited where you have lots of humans, but I'm from Rift's Earth. All right, we'll deal with true names and character names and all that later. So the next thing is my age. Kevin Simbita has always said that, you know, your character is likely young in their late teens, early 20s. And so what I've done is I said, well, we can randomize that. Right? We can make a character between the ages of 15 and 32 by rolling 12 plus 3d6. And so we'll do it random. So slash r 12 plus 3d6. There's the dice. There's 20. So my character is 20 years old. All right. Age 20. By the way, this is a modification of a sheet that's found in Roll20. Again, I'll put the link down below so that you can have access to it as well, to the code for that. Yeah, so we've got our um, age, and now we move on to disposition. This one, I, same with age, we can choose or we can roll, uh, but we're going to do a roll for this one just to be as random as we can be. So 
I'm gonna roll our d100 again. 87. If I look on page 297 of Rift's Ultimate Edition, 97 gives me a piece, or sorry, 87 rather, gives me easy going. Uh, let's see, yeah. This character is unflappable and calm most of the time. Laid back and accepting of others. Trusts almost anyone until they are proven untrustworthy of that trust. Well, that sounds pleasant. Almost too pleasant for Rift's Earth. But there we go. Easy going. That's the disposition. There we go. I'm going to put human there. All right. Next up, height and weight. Now, the funny thing about Rift's Earth is it says on page 297 of Rift's Ultimate that the average height for a human male, and this is probably North American height because it presumes that that's your default setting, is six feet two inches. That is the average height of a person on Rift's Earth. I don't know what happened to gravity on Rift's Earth, but six feet two inches is actually kind of tall. So your average height there is six foot two. I'm gonna make a male, and he's gonna be average, six two. And if we go by weight, we're going to make him average weight as well. So we'll say he's about 200 pounds. At 6'2". Cool. Next, environment growing up. We, on 297, we choose a roll. Well, we're going to randomize it, so here comes the roll. And the dice say 68. Environment growing up. A small town magic community where magic, creatures of magic, DBs, and ethnic diversity was commonplace. Well, no wonder he's so easygoing. So this is a small magic town. Cool. All right. Uh, reason for adventuring is next. So that's going to be on page 298. Why is this bot guy bothering to leave his nice magic town? A 15. Oh, he's an outlaw. Fascinating. Outlaw, uh, yeah, outlaw, and on the run. Interesting, cool, cool motivation. All right, let's take a look at another one. Here is birth order. It's interesting. Birth order tells you a few things. Actually, it tells you that you are, uh, well, not necessarily alone in your family, right? You might have siblings. You might have nobody. Um, it's so common for people to want to make the person whose parents have died and has no connections to anybody, and so he's all alone. But those make for really boring characters because you have no connection to anybody. It'd be great if you could go visit the town that your brother lives in, and all of a sudden you now have all sorts of interesting role-playing opportunities. Not only that, there's great incentive for you to do things because your brother may need help doing something. And it always, you don't always have to put the family in peril, Game Masters. The brother could just need you to go, you know, help bring in some cattle from the other town because you're there, and you might run into something along the road, like bandits or, or other things like that, right? There's all sorts of things that having a lot of connections to the world around you provides for your characters. It makes them much more interesting. So we're going to give a percentile check on the birth order and see what we got here. And again, we'll show the dice. 16 puts me at firstborn. Okay, so I'm firstborn. And we're going to roll 2d4 to see out of how many. Let's see. 2d4. What do we got? Eight. Nice big family. All right, so I'm firstborn of eight. I've got a lot of younger siblings. Um, I'm going to just jot that down here. I don't have a field for it on this sheet. I should put, probably put it in. So this is birth order, first born of eight. Cool. First born of eight kids. And next is sentiments toward the coalition states. So if I take a look again, this is on page 297, 298 in Riff's Ultimate. Yeah. Shrink this this time, and we'll give it a roll. A 
42. All right, so this character distrusts and um, fears the coalition states, has seen many injustices and atrocities and acts of ruthlessness at the hands of the CS military, especially against non-humans, practitioners of magic, and those of different beliefs. Well, that, that kind of makes sense because he's from a small magic town and uh, he's rather easygoing, which means those sorts of actions would really uh, affect him. So cool. So distrusts and fears the coalition states. Cool. All right. And now let's take a look at the last one, which is sentiments toward non-humans. 14. He... <clears throat> This is again on page 298 in Rift's Ultimate. Rolling a 14 gives me the fact that he hates all demons, monsters, and supernatural creatures, does not like or trust DBs or mutants in general, fears and hates those with demonic features and mind control powers. And you might say, but this kind of contradicts the whole thing about his place of origin, right? His environment which was, again, a small town magic community where magic creatures of magic DBs and ethnic diversity were commonplace. Sure, but that doesn't mean he didn't come from a background where he was led to distrust those, particularly those that are really scary looking, right? I mean, think about our society now. It's nice to want to imagine uh, a very egalitarian world that we get to play in where there is no discrimination and there is no hatred and there are no things like this. But that's not a very good way of rising above those things, right? In our role-playing games, if we have those aspects in our worlds and don't glorify them, but make them real bad things that will exist in our worlds, discrimination, hatred based on how people look, things like that, it gives an opportunity to overcome those Right? It gives us an opportunity to rise above them and actually play out a way in which those things can be overcome. Rather than creating a sterile world, let's make one that's filled with problems that need to be overcome. That way our characters can actually be heroes. So this guy has some trouble with DBs that are... Um, in general, he doesn't like or trust them, but uh, he particularly fears and hates those things with demonic features and mind control power. So he doesn't trust things that can get into your head. So hates demonic and mind control I'm going to say does not trust. That's a good way of summarizing here. Does not trust, hates demons. There we go. That's a fair reference for now. And that's kind of the determining of the background of the character first before we even got to the role for, um, for attributes. All right. So we, if human, second point says, choose an RCC based on the family origin. Well, that's human. Got it. Okay. If human, roll on the special human traits and abilities in the Lone Star World Book number 96, page 96. So what's cool about uh, the Lone Star World Book is that it has a couple charts that acknowledge that not every human is identical, that even within humans and within other DBs as well, you're going to have certain... Um, genetic variation that give people some advantage. And I like that. That helps not every human be kind of cookie cutter-ish. It also gives humans a little bit more of a, a different flavor because DBs kind of get those different flavors, right? They're, they're like the non-human races in other games, right? They get something special. Well, this helps humans be not particularly extraordinary, but gives them some sort of, potentially gives them that. So if I look on page 97 of World Book 13, the Lone Star World Book, there is um, a three tables or two tables. First table I have to roll on says the number of abilities. So how many abilities do I get? So if I'm human, zero to 60 gives me nothing. 61 to 80 gives me one and 81 to 100 gives me two. So let's roll the D hundred here. Showing you a 84, which gives me two. So I get two genetic variations 
So let's roll the first one on the next table, spe human special abilities table, it's called. And that is a 90, which is exceptionally charismatic. Most people instantly find the character attractive, even if not physically beautiful, and are inclined to trust and believe him, at least until they get to know him. And this can be used for good or evil. Raise the character's mental affinity to 20 plus 1d4. Okay, we'll do that. I'm going to note it here, but we're going to do that after we roll our abilities. So this is mental affinity raises to 20 plus 1d4. Cool. All right, let's take a look at the second ability. A seven. Double jointed, plus five percent to escape skill, escape artist probably, and plus one to roll with punch, fall, or impact. Cool. So we'll pop that in here for now, just as some notes. So first one is exceptionally charismatic, and the other one is double jointed. Cool. So now he's not just a regular generic human. He's got something to it. Okay, cool. Next, number three. Roll the number of dice listed for the RCC for each attribute in order using the following rules. If the roll that I have to roll based on the RCC is 2d6 and I get a 12, then I roll another d6. But that's not the case for humans. Humans just are 3d6. So if the roll is 3d6 and the roll is a 16 to 18, then I add another 1d6, which is the standard rules for rifts. If the roll result on that die is a 6, then I add a final d6. Again, standard rules for rolling 3d6 for attributes for rifts. That's what I'm going to do for my human, but I'll go through the, la the rest just in case it were a db or a non-human. If the roll contains a modifier, for example, if I had to roll 3d6 plus 2, then it's added after all the rolling is finished. If the roll has four or more dice, no extra dice are rolled. If more than half of the attributes are below 10, scrap the entire character. So I've done all this work, and if my attributes, if I randomly roll them, and I get half the attributes are less than 10, we just start over. If there's one attribute below seven, then I can add 1d4 plus 3 to any one other attribute. Interesting. If there are two attributes below 7, then I can add 1d4 plus 5 to any one other attribute, and either plus 3 to another attribute, or plus 2 to my perception. Alright, well, let's see what we got. We're going to roll 3d6 for IQ. Alright, 15. IQ is 15. He's rather intelligent. Let's roll 3d6 for the next one. Another 15. Mental endurance, 15. Let's roll yet another 3d6. 8. All right. Mental affinity, 8, but we know that that's going to change. Another 3d6. 13 for physical strength. All right. And another 3d6. A 13 for physical prowess. All right. A 9 for physical endurance, which is around average. And let's take a look at physical beauty. 12. And let's take a look at speed. Eight. All right. So mostly an average guy is a bit above average mentally, um, you know, but his, uh, his mental affinity, physical endurance and speed kind of average out his other ones. Nothing exceptional on the roll. So for in this game, you only get bonuses from your attributes. If you have a roll that is 16 or higher, now I'm going to go in with my exceptionally charismatic and I'm going to roll that d4 
for what they say there. That's a three. So my mental affinity is not an eight because of that. It's a 23. Now that's going to give me a bonus, but we're going to do bonuses derived from attributes uh, after we've done a few more things here. So cool. Well, that's where we are with that. And now we're going to move on to base hit points. So this is before we even look at any sort of occupational character classes, right? We're just going to take a look at what uh, base hit points and SDC would be. So hit points, I'm not a mega damage creature, so I don't, I stay on hit points here and I roll 1d6 and add my physical endurance. That's how many hit points I have. That's a three. My physical endurance currently is a nine, so I have 12 hit points. There we go. SDC, structural damage capacity. This is the kind of rough and tumble sort of bumps and bruises that this character can handle before actually being hurt fit like deeply. And that is 12 plus 2d6. So let's roll 2d6. And I got a four plus 12 is 16. There we go. He has no natural AR and he has no other things uh, like that. PPE, um, it's not listed on the sheet here, but I know that that's 2d6 for the average person. So that's eight PPE. That could change depending upon what um, his class gives him. And ISP will have to determine whether or not he's psionic. Um, there's always a chance, same with horror factor and perception uh, is based on any bonuses to IQ and things like that. Cool. So that's the random role for attributes. And now we have to take a look at the possible OCCs. So looking around at the different OCCs and the like, I see that with these kind of attributes, there's very few things that I don't qualify for. Interestingly enough, there's some like the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the ley line walker, for example, that my physical endurance isn't high enough to qualify for. Um, and others like the cyber knight, uh, they want a higher physical endurance, so it's not recommended. So I'm going to go for classes that are only recommended based on my, um, based on my attributes. And this character is from a small magic town who he distrusts and fears the coalition states and he doesn't trust DBs, and he hates demons. And so I figure, and he doesn't like people that can read people's minds and things like that, so I don't think a psychic is the best thing for him, one of the psychic classes. Uh, he qualifies for it, certainly. But I think what, qualify, what he qualifies for best is a shifter. He, he, it's recommended based on his attributes, and... It's kind of cool because he's from a small magic town. Magic is commonplace, so he learns how to use magic. Okay. But shifters, they don't really trust um, DBs and non-humans because they bind them to their service, right? They kind of summon them and bind them. And he hates demons, so he might not use demons, right? But he might use other non-human creatures and bind them to his service because he doesn't trust them right? The magic is his, what he's trusting in, not those creatures. And he's putting them to his will, not necessarily the will of their own, which kind of ensures that they're doing the things that he thinks are right. So he's not necessarily the nicest of people. He's pretty easygoing, sure, but his alignment, this will kind of flavor his alignment a little bit when we get to that. So I'm going to make him a shifter, which is kind of cool. A lot of things are kind of cool here. All right, so I've chosen the shifter, which means we're gonna have a few different um, things we gotta touch on here. But the shifter is, is a really cool character class. All right, so if we start with the shifter and we start looking, shifter starts on page 120 of the Rift's Ultimate Edition. And if we look, um, there's a number of abilities they give him right out of the gate, but I'm going to jump down till I get to the things that actually modify this character. So there's all sorts of abilities, sensing rifts and familiar link and summoning and all of these things. Also, his really high mental affinity attribute is great for being this kind of summoner. 
So I jump down to the bonuses, magic bonuses. So a shifter is plus four to save versus horror factor at level one. So on this sheet, saving throws are under the combat. Horror factor, he's plus four at level one. Cool. All right. And plus one to save for magic, it's at three. Plus one to spell strength at level four. And plus one to save, or plus three to save versus possession and mind control at level one, which is great because he does not like things that mess up your mind. So possession and mind control are plus three, and those will go up as he increases in level. His PPE is 2d6 times 10 plus 10 plus his physical endurance attribute. Okay, so there's 2d6. That's 8. So that's 80 plus 10 is 90. And his physical endurance is 9, so that's 99. So if his physical endurance changes, then his, phys his PPE will change, as will his hit points. All right, what else here? Um, we get his PPE recovery rate of 10 points per hour of meditation, and so on and so forth. Link to the supernatural. All right, we'll go back to those powers later. But we're going to... Oh, there we go. Alignment. A, a shifter typically starts out as unprincipled or anarchist, but can be any alignment. I'm going to make him unprincipled because he's an easygoing guy, um, and I like playing good to good selfish characters um, because it gives me some sort of aspirations beyond just doing whatever the hell I want. So unprincipled is a good place to be. And now we get a lot of skills, and that is the nature of rifts. There are a lot of skills. We'll start with his OCC skills, and the first one is language. It says native tongue, so in this game, English is called American. It starts at 98%, and we don't put anything in per level on this. I always have a little reference spot here so I know where to look, but I'm not going to do that right now. He gets another language. Uh, two more, actually. So language, I'm going to give him Dragonese, which is the standard magical language. And he gets a bonus of plus 15%, so we'll just put the bonus in for now. And then he gets another language. I'm going to say that, uh, what's a good one here? Let's try uh, gobbly. That's the language of orcs and ogres and goblins and things like that. So maybe he's learned a little bit of that. That's also out of 15. He's literate, which is unusual for rifts, in his native language, which is at a plus 30%. And he's literate in one of the other two languages that he can speak, which I'm going to say is Dragonese. And he gets a plus 20% on that one. Ooh, hello. There we go. Cool. Next, he gets Astronomy. And that's at plus 20%. And Mathematics Basic. Cool. And that is 15%. He gets Lore, Demon, and Monster, which is appropriate. So that's 20%. He gets something called lower dimensions. Because these guys are big dimensional travelers. And he gets a plus 20% to that as well. And lore, we got a lot of lore. Cool. Lore fairy. And creatures of magic. And that one is at plus 15%. And he gets lore magic at an additional 15%. He also gets land navigation. 
a bonus there is 10%. And again, I'm at Rifts Ultimate Edition, page 125, 126. Wilderness Survival with a bonus of 5%. So he gets a hand-to-hand -hand skill, which is unusual. Not all magic users start with a hand-to-hand -hand skill. So I'm going to jump to combat real quick. Go to hand-to-hand -to -hand and give him hand-to-hand -hand basic. There we go. Back to skills. And those are his OCC skills. Those are the skills that all shifters get. All characters get OCC-related skills. That is, skills that are related to their occupation, that because of their close relationship with the occupation, they get bonuses. Cool. Well, what are some of the things that um, he might need? So his physical endurance is rather low, so it makes me think, and so is his uh, speed. So I have running on the mind. But running I could take as a secondary skill. I don't want to waste skills. I don't want to waste the bonuses that I could potentially get um, for OCC-related skills by taking one that doesn't even have a percentage, like running. So I'm looking at what he gets. He gets um, an additional 5% on all communication skills and an additional 10% on languages and public speaking. And this guy has a high mental affinity, and he's relatively charismatic. So I think I'm probably going to give him public speaking. Just because it seems to make sense. So he gets a 10% bonus on that. I don't know, it just seems to make sense that he's able to be that sort of orator. right? He's able to deliver a good good um, thing. For these, um, on this sheet, I've I put the level that they're acquired at, and it will automatically, um, <clears throat> as you get skills as you go up in level, it will automatically calculate things based on that and based on the level that I set for the overall character. So that's pretty cool there. Um, he gets a bonus for domestic skills. He gets a bonus for espionage and he gets a bonus for medical skills, but only first aid, holistic medicine, or paramedic. Hmm, okay. He gets a plus 2% on rogue skills. All right. And plus 5% on science, and plus 5% on technical skills. All right. Well, hmm. Let's see. I think I'm going to make this guy kind of flashy. There's a skill called wardrobe and grooming that actually gives you a bump to your physical beauty when you're dressed to impress. And so I think that I'm going to do that because if he's going to be this kind of orator kind of character, it's a domestic skill. He's going to get a bonus with it. So wardrobe and grooming. He's a styling guy. And he's a good speaker, so we're going to give him that. That's cool. Let's see. So he gets a total of six of these. Six of these OCC-related skills. So what else is he going to need? Um, hmm. I'm going to give him a medical skill, just in case. And I'm going to go with holistic medicine. only because he doesn't seem to strike me as a as a very techno technological kind of guy um he's more of a kind of he's going to be exploring other dimensions he's going to use what's around him sort of thing all right so i get three more i want rogue skills he gets and i'm going to give him prowl because i think prowl is a very useful skill he gets a two percent bonus um, and he could take it as a physical skill, but he wouldn't get a bonus then. So if he takes it as a rogue skill, he'll get a 2% bonus. And what else do we have here? Technical skills and science skills. He's got astronomy, which is really good for predicting uh, planetary alignments and the like. So that's useful. Um, yeah, nothing really strikes me here. But he does get a bonus to... Astronomy, if he takes mathematics advanced. 
and that kind of jumped out. So I'm going to give him Mathematics Advanced. So that's all right there. It's a 5% bonus. He doesn't have a whole lot as far as weapons go, but he uses a lot of magic. And he'll have other things that can fight for him, but it might be a really good idea for him to have some sort of weapon proficiency. And he only gets two skills down there, so I'm going to give him horsemanship. He knows how to ride horses. He has general horsemanship. <clears throat> There's no bonus for that, but his secondary skills, I really want to give him a little bit more speed and endurance, so I'm going to pick running. And we'll give him a weapon proficiency. I think we'll give him something at range, so I'm going to give him energy rifle. There we go. So that's a lot of stuff there. And now we have to go through and find all of the percentages that we get for these skills. And so we'll do that real fast. It's a matter of just going and hunting down all the skills here. So with Dragonese Language Other, it starts at 50%. He gets a 15% bonus, so he's at 65%. And every level, it goes up by 3%. Cool. And it automatically fills in there. I'm going to put a zero there for his native because it doesn't go past 98%. For the other language as well, this is at 65% and 3% per level. Literacy, a native language, is 40% plus 5% per level. And he gets a 30% bonus. So that's 70%, 5% per level. And for other languages, it's 30% plus 5% per level. So... He's at 50% there. For astronomy and navigation, it starts at 30%. So he's at 50%, 5% per level. Mathematics basic starts at 45, so he's at 60%, 5% per level. And all the lores are fairly identical in what they are at. Demon and monster, fairies and creatures of magic and magic all start at 25%. So this is 45%, 5%, 45%, 5%, 5%, and 40%, 5%, 40%, 5%. Now, lore magic has a few sub skills that are part of it. And you can see this for yourself on page 325. Base skill is 25, but recognizing magic symbols, uh, runes, and circles. So base skill is 25, but recognizing magic symbols, runes, and circles uh, is at a base of 15. So I usually do this. I just call it mag recognize magic symbols, and that's at a 15. Plus 15 is 30 percent, 5 percent per level cool and he also there's another sub skill called uh, recognize enchantment which includes when they have what they have underlined in there called identify magic artifact that's a bit of a typo for those of you that are following on the page there so that would be at 25 percent there cool and i'm just going to put these just beneath lore magic all right, land navigation and wilderness survival. Land navigation starts at 36%, so that's at 56%, or sorry, 46%, 4% per level. And wilderness survival starts at 30%, so we're at 35 and 5. All right, there we go. So public speaking is a communication skill that starts at 30%. He gets a 10% bonus, so that's 40%. 5% per level. Wardrobe and grooming is a domestic skill. 
and that one starts at 50%, so he's at 55%, 4% per level, that's pretty good, and that'll actually add to his physical beauty, which is a weird thing that he'll get. Holistic medicine is, is oh, it's a split skill, so it's got two functions, so we're going to, so holistic medicine, first one, first percentage is diagnosis. So for him to diagnose the problem, that's at 30%, so he's at a 35% there, 5% per level. And the second one for holistic medicine, that one is um, the skill at treating the problem. So this is treatment. All right, and that's at 20%, 5%. Below. So he'd be at 25 with his bonus. And there we go. And we'll move that up under the other holistic medicine as well. All right. He's got prowl as a rogue skill. And so that's the same percentage as though it were taken as the physical skill, but he gets the bonus. So that means he's at 27%, 5% per level. Mathematics advanced is a science skill. And that's 45 and 5, so he's at 50%, 5% per level. And that gives a 10% bonus to astronomy in navigation. So that's at 60 now. Horsemanship, that's another skill that's split as well, kind of like uh, holistic medicine. So the first percentile is general level of expertise in riding and care of horses. So that's cool. So where are we? Riding and caring. And the second one is tricks, which includes combat. We'll just call this one riding. There we can read it. All right, first percentage for horsemanship general is 40% plus 20% per level. Or, sorry, not 20% per level, 4% per level. 20% for the one about doing tricks, 4% per level. There we go. <clears throat> Secondary skill, uh, running, he gets there. That's a physical skill, and running gives you 1 to your physical endurance. Puts him at a 10. That puts his hit points up to 13, and gives him an even 100 on the PPE. And it gives you 4d4 to your speed. So let's roll 4d4 for our speed. Gives him 13 more speed, all the way up to 21. Not bad. And also it gives 1d6 for SDC. So five more SDC puts him at 21. There we go. And that is almost all of his skills. We just have to do his weapon proficiency and energy rifle, which if you're looking for the bonuses for modern weapons, when it comes to uh, like the ranged combat bonuses, you have to actually go down to ranged combat on page 360, and that's where they're all listed. So at first level, he gets no bonus to strike with energy rifle. At second level, he'll get a bonus. All right, so there's there. We're going to jump over hand-to-hand. Uh, -hand. Basic is the hand-to-hand -hand he gave, so we're going to just write down what he gets with these things. Very basic stuff. I'm just going to copy and paste the notes from page 347 in Rift's Ultimate here so that we have that information about what it gives us. Number of attacks, he'll have four attacks because you start with four attacks. He'll get two to pull punch which means he doesn't have to clobber somebody every time he punches them, and two to roll with punch, fall, or impact. Now, 
Now if I jump back here, he gets an additional one to roll with Punch, Fall, or Impact, and plus 5% to the Escape skill, which I think means he just gets it anyway. So I'm just going to put that down here. And he's got that as a base 5%. It doesn't go up. That's just what he's got for Escape Artist from his double jointedness. So there's a chance he can get out just because he can contort himself, but that's it. If we go back and look, um, Mental Affinity at 23 gives him a 60% on Trust or Intimidate. His Physical Beauty, he's only going to be able to bring up to 13, so he gets no bonus on Charm or Impress. And we can start filling out a few other things here. Uh, note that he can't swim. He doesn't have that uh, physical skill. Uh, he might be able to keep his head above water if push comes to shove. But let's just quickly jump to what he would have for his lifting ability, how much he can carry and lift. And so for the average dude, because his physical strength is only 13, he can, if you want to find this information, it is on page 286 in Rift's Ultimate. So between physical strength between 3 and 16 can carry 10 times their physical strength in pounds. So he can carry 130, and it automatically doubled that for how much he can just pick up and lift, which is 260 pounds. And he can carry that around given his um, physical endurance for 40 minutes um, under exertion only 20 minutes, and he can pick up 260 pounds for 30 seconds before having to let go. His run speed is automatically calculated. Base leap, uh, he can leap four feet up and five feet across. Um, yeah, and his base run is, uh, your, your speed is actually just how fast you go in feet per second. And so we multiply that by 15 and that's what you get feet per round, 315 feet per round. Do the math and that's 14 miles an hour. And he can keep that up for his physical endurance in minutes, which is kind of cool. So he's, he's not bad. So if we look, we, did, we just did step six, right? The OCC skills. Now we have to determine if he is psychic. Randomly, we do this on page 289 is the chart. And there's a percentage chance that any character is psychic. So that's a percentile roll. Let's see what we get. 97, this guy is not psychic, so he has no ISP. He has no horror factor, and yeah, I don't know if he even has a perception bonus. But let's go back to see what else this shifter has. Now we get into all the nitty-gritty. We already chose the alignment. Uh, note the experience for next level. Okay, we'll do that. I guess we'll jump in here. So he's not psychic. Um, next step is we choose the alignment we already chose on principle. Uh, and now we note the experience required for the next level. He is a shifter, which means he needs 2,120 experience to get to level 2. And determine equipment as per OCC. So the last thing we have to do is all of the other stuff. Equipment includes all of the special abilities and stuff he gets for being a shifter. So let's go back to the shifter all the way back to page 120 in Rift's Ultimate. We'll start with his spell knowledge. Magic. What does he get? He gets... Let's see. Initial spell knowledge. Shifter's focus of mystic knowledge is on spells to summon and control supernatural creatures from the rifts, as well as control over the rifts. Thus, a shifter starts with the following spells. Cool. Calling. And we'll look it all up, but it gives me the PPE cost. So, because sometimes this is different depending on the class. So, calling for it, call lightning. And that's for 15. He gets compulsion at 20 PPE cost. He also gets constrained being at a 20 PPE cost. He gets Dimensional Portal, 
which will cost him 1,000, so obviously not something he's going to be casting by himself out on the battlefield, but he can open one up if he gets enough PPE. Energy Bolt, nice little SDC ranged attack for 5 PPE. And Energy Field, which is a nice domed shield. Exorcism, which is a great spell when you're dealing with things that can possess people, like demons. And Repel Animals. That's at 7. And Reopen Gateway, which is kind of neat. If you need to reopen a portal that somebody just jumped through, you can follow them through. Sense Evil, which I think this guy is kind of all about with his hatred of demons and things that can read your mind and stuff like that. Sense Magic, useful. Trance, for 10 PPE. And what else we got? Shadow Meld, that's good for disappearing because uh, not even see the invisible can detect you with that. So shadow meld, ten. What else we got? Summon and control canines. That's at fifty. Summon and control rodents. That's at seventy. You might be like, well, why big deal? You can summon dogs and rats. Who cares? But these things can be useful for you, right? They can do things for you. They're like extensions of you, especially rodents. They can get into small spaces and stuff. So it's not super useless. Sustain. Like magic in this game is not about a lot of direct combat stuff. It's about control. Time slip. 20. Turn dead. I like the Palladium just calls them the dead. They're not the undead. They're still dead. And they're just, you know, moving around. And tongues to allow him to speak all sorts of languages for a mere 10 PPE. Cool. Number two, learning new spells. Okay, the shifter's focus is on dimensional travel, energies that create rifts and creatures who travel from one dimension to the other. As a result, the shifter's spell knowledge leans towards spells that summon, control, and influence others. Deals with channeling and controlling energy and dimensional travel. Starting at level 2, you can choose one spell from a list that's on page 121 in Rifts. Alright. And I would go through and I would copy the details and everything out of the book and paste them here as well as the different spell levels and everything, but we're not going to do that right now. I'm going to jump to abilities. These are things that the shifter can do. The first one is Dimension Sense. Dimension Sense, cool. And this says, shifters are innately in tune to dimensions and dimensional energies. After only a few minutes of concentrating, they're able to tell the difference. Uh, sorry, they're able to tell what type of dimension it is. Oh, it's a skill. Okay, cool. So. And so I'm gonna add that here. And that's at 35%, 5% per level. It's part of the OCC, so I'm going to slap it there in OCC skills. And what I do with things like this is I just note that they're a skill in the uh, in the name of it. And I can copy and paste the, um, the content of this ability into the notes area there, the ability text. The ability text just to... So I don't have to look it up in the book all the time and things like that, but I do have an area for reference and such. Next ability is Dimensional Travel. The shifter's most powerful ability is to open Dimensional Gateway. For a base cost of 125 PPE, a shifter can create a one-way dimensional portal. Each additional person costs some additional 25. Well, that's kind of nice. So 
Yeah, it gives the details there. So this is essentially going to be a special type of spell. So I'm going to put that under magic and I'm going to put it at the very top because it's just special to him. And it's called dimensional travel. And it is 125 plus PPE because it's got a few other things. So let's just bring this one all the way to the top. There we go. All the way to the top. Now he's got dimensional travel there and yeah, all the info is on page 122. I'm going to note that right now. Rift's Ultimate Edition 122, so I can know where to look to get the info to paste later. Cool. Communication Rift. This is another type spell. All right. Basically, it allows him, allows him to open up a tiny little rift that he can, can commune through with another thing. And... If he's at a nexus point, it's super cheap, but otherwise it's different. But we're going to call this communication rift. And we'll put the 50 slash 100 slash 200 into PPE because those are the three different costs depending on where he's at. And it also has a skill percent. Interesting. So I'm going to just note that here that it has a skill roll. And we'll put Communication Rift back on the skills page. And it is at 20 plus 5% per level. There we go. So... Dimensional teleport home. So, dimensional So, dimensional teleport home. And that's for 75 PPE and it's just him. All right. Cool. We're going to move these guys up to the top because they are special shifter skills just to keep them all the way up there. Our spells for the shifter. There we go. They're all up there. And they are all on Rift's Ultimate 122. So I'll put that in now just for myself. So I remember. All right. He can also sense rifts. Range on that is 50 plus 20 miles per level of experience. Cool. And <clears throat> yeah, there's no skill percent or anything like that. He just senses them. Neat. So I'm going to copy and paste the text right now so I have that in here just to be able to use it because it's short. There we go. All right. And the next one is a useful thing. Just like summoning rodents and canines are useful. Familiar link. Very useful. references just in case familiar link very cool gives you a small inconspicuous creature like a weasel squirrel bat bird cat dog wolf I don't know many inconspicuous wolves but okay um, for scouting spying and reconnaissance 
cool. And it gives bonuses to save versus poison, save versus mind control and possession. And if you lose the, if the animal is killed, you lose 10 point hit points permanently. Ooh, brutal. But it gives you six additional points as part of the connection. Okay, so you lose four. All right. <clears throat> and then it goes into all of the summoning. So I'm just going to put down summoning here. Because he has that ability. But I'm not going to write down a whole lot because... Yeah, it's a lot of based on his mental affinity and so on and so forth, but yeah, all right. About making pacts and all these other things. We already did the magical bonuses, we already did the PPE. Now I'm on page 124. Link to the supernatural optional, it's always there. I say it's optional because the shifter can choose whether or not they want to undertake it, but it's always available to them, in my humble opinion. And it would be good for this guy if he hates demons so much. Um, and he wants to control things and the like, probably connecting with a god of magic, because he's not evil, so he wouldn't connect with a god of darkness. But connecting with a god of magic, not too bad. Warrior God, he's not much of a tangler, he's much more of a talker. And Nature Spirit Deity, mm, I don't think so. So he's going to be connected with the gods of magic. Cool, and we can figure out what that is, but all of them give the same thing. They all get an addition, they all give rather an additional 2d6 SDC. So we're gonna roll SDC for this guy. Another six SDC. So he's at 27 SDC. That's cool. And 1d6 times 10 plus 40 to his PPE. There's a d6. 40 plus 40 is 80. So you get, he's at 180 PPE. All right, and plus one to save versus magic. We can do that. All of these get the bonus to save versus magic because they're all magic. That soul drinking. All right, and next is plus three to save versus possession. Well, that's good because he doesn't like that. So let's go down here, positions we've got six. Cool. And next one is the choice of eight spells selected from levels three to thirteen. Alright. If the shifter proves worthy at levels four and eight, he gets plus one to spell strength. Nice. But this this particular deity has something that it wants and the shifter now has to act as his agent. So, interesting. It's kind of cool. All right, so the last thing, stuff, equipment. So he gets, oh, he does get an energy rifle. Good thing I took that weapon proficiency. He gets a few things here. He gets a set of clothing, set of traveling clothes, light mega damage body armor, Rarely wears heavy because it interviews with magic. Um, knapsack, backpack, 1d4, small sacks, one large sack. Pocket mirror, silver cross, large wooden cross, 2d4 cloves of garlic, six wooden stakes and a mallet. Salt, canteen, binoculars, tinted goggles or sunglasses. This is a sunglasses kind of guy, I think. Air filter, gas mask, pocket laser distancer, pocket digital disc recorder or player for recording his observations. Handheld computer, if proficient with computers, which he's not, so he doesn't get that. And he often wears hooded robes and dark clothing. He'll get himself a survival knife and a hand axe, submachine gun with silver bullets in it, an energy rifle with 1d4 plus 2 extra energy clips, and a javelin-like iron rod sharpened on one end. The rod is generally it measures about 3 feet long, for easy carrying and is used to dispel certain magic illusions and monsters which are affected by being pierced by iron. V 
Vehicle of choice is often a motorcycle or hovercycle or horse. Something small, inexpensive, and easily replaced in case it's destroyed by a creature from a rift or left behind when exploring. Makes me want to change what I chose for horsemanship. I think I want him to be able to traverse very complex ground, and so I think instead of horsemanship, I'm going to give him pilot hovercraft ground. So we're going to jump real quick to the skills because that's he'll get a hovercraft and they're a little bit more well what happens if a rift spits you out right and you got nowhere to land well if you're on water the hovercraft will still work if you're on a horse not so much so hovercraft ground 50 percent five percent per level there we go all right so then what he has for piloting We've got his hand-to-hand, -hand. we've got his energy stuff, and that's it. i got to pick a few more spells, because I get some spells for basically selling my soul to a god of magic. But that's pretty much it. So the rest is just picking spells and whatnot, filling in all the details, filling out your equipment sheets and the like, and yeah, so it's kind of shopping. But yeah, that's making a Rift's character by random roll. And he's kind of cool, right? Like, I, I don't know if I would have made the shifter this way if, if I didn't roll him this way. I don't think I would have. Like, an easygoing guy that's from a small magic town who doesn't like demons? Well, that doesn't sound like your typical shifter. You know, plus he's an outlaw on the run. Well, I bet you it's because he's been summoning stuff and people didn't like that. You know, but it all it's cool how it just all fits together. It's it's not something that I planned, and yet the dice just give me this really neat character that has all sorts of potential. Right? He's the first of eight kids, which means he's got a bunch of younger siblings. He's on the run now. How does he you know, like what if you were an older sibling and now you're on the run? Well you think about what your siblings might think of you, right? You were setting an example for them, things like that. You know, all sorts of cool opportunities that arise simply because instead of coming up with the character idea, the dice gave us the character. And, um, yeah, he's kind of cool. I think I'd, I'd want to play a guy like this. He might show up as, a, as an NPC at some point. You know, that might be kind of neat. So, anyway, um, yeah. Let me know what you think. Until next time, I'm Magnum Pi, and this is Initiative Zero.